All right. As we know, with anything involving technology or presentations, it never goes exactly the way that you want it to. So there's bound to be something that's going to happen. But of course, that's important to just go with the flow. So you are in a meetup about K-pop and the podcast community. We are talking about maximizing on fandom culture and specialty markets. I use the word specialty instead of the word niche because it's overdone. It is the same thing, but you always hear niche, niche, niche. So I just went with specialty just to make it a little bit easier. My name is Ashley Griffin. In one aspect of entertainment, I'm better known as multifaceted ACG. So it is the word multifaceted and my initials, Ashley Charlton Griffin, just shoved together. So I am available on a lot of social media platforms, but in this case, I am known for a podcast that I host that you can learn a little bit more about when you type a3daypodcast.com. It'll take you directly to the website and you'll be able to check out some things there. So let's get into this, this whole K-pop thing. It's not cake pop, but K-pop. So we're using a little bit of the Hallyu or genre or specialty specific uh, jargon here when we say steps to debut. But it does parallel with you as podcasters. Maybe you haven't started just yet. Maybe you've been sitting on the fence and you're like, I got an idea, but eh, I don't know really where I want to start with that. That's fine. It's common. So steps to debut can go twofold. First and foremost, we're going to discuss what is K-pop and give you just a little bit of history about the birth of the Hallyu wave and what that even means. Types of fandom podcasts, and I'm going to give you an example of common formats. And then the three mistakes fandom podcasts should avoid. There's countless things that you should avoid, but I'm just going to give you three and how you can start on the right foot if you're just getting into this. So much the same, like a lot of other people who have been holding meetups during this particular event, I have screens everywhere. So if you see my eyes darting around, I'm making sure that this is running. I'm making sure that that's doing what it needs to do. And some of you who have watched some of the larger presentations in the main WOVA app, um, some people have had like five monitors. It's insane. So I currently have two and a half. So again, my name is Ashley Griffin. I am better known as Multifaceted ACG. I am a communications and education professional. I'm also a content creator. So I have over 20 years of diverse work experience with leadership, management, administrative, consultancy, and things of that sort, as well as uh, PR and marketing. I've also dabbled a little bit in a r work within the American music industry. So a lot of diversity unexpected as such, but it exists nonetheless. I've been a podcast host since 2013. Now, some people who are familiar with me, they have known of me being an online content creator since 2013, but not a podcaster. I've had multiple ones, and I currently have two that I'm responsible for, but the one that I am most known for is Multifaceted ACG Presents an Album a Day, and that is a Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. Central Time short cast, so it's about 10 to 12 minutes, a long episode, might be 15 to 20 minutes, where I am working through the actual active 30-year history of Korean pop music and entertainment. It's extremely ambitious. It's absolutely one of the craziest things I have ever decided to do, but I'm committed to it. And season four will begin on August 24th, 2020. Prior to the announcement of all of this in terms of the entire summit going on, I had just learned that I had surpassed a little over 8,000 downloads or 8,000 listeners for the show. And the show was started May 9th, 2019. So that's a huge accomplishment, creating this evergreen content that people can easily go back to listen and just be like, wow, it's already into the fourth season. And yes, one of the listeners just said, can't wait for the A's. We are literally going numerically and alphabetically in order. Rookies, defunct, disbanded, and everything in between. It's, it's chaotic. And once we finish going through this, which God only knows when that'll be, we'll be looking at the indie scene, the hip hop and R&B, as well as going back more historically towards trot. So my whole ambitious goal is to be this big deal music historian. 
I've also written that on there that I want to be a Korean music historian and my whole tagline, if you will, with this is your favorite foreign Korean music historian exploring all the industry from A to Z. And I'm legitimately doing it. It's a lot of fun. It's a little overwhelming, but it's not the only thing that I do. But it's one of the more important aspects of the facets of myself. So my K-pop journey, just a quick trip down memory lane, I became a fan of all of this interesting music and the, the genre and the films and everything in October of 2012. I found it by way of a K-drama. I'm not a big TV watcher. However, I was looking for something to kind of distract me from some other things that were going on. Came across a show which led me down a rabbit hole that connected actors who could also sing or model to singing and modeling actors who happened to be in groups to groups that had a multitude of nine to 13 members in it, things I had never seen outside of a mariachi band. So it was very interesting to me, very engaging. I have a background in performing arts when I was a young lady. So being able to see the theatrics of it all, the videos, the choreography, the filmography and everything, it just swallowed me whole completely. Uh, for a few years of that, I was heavily involved on YouTube under a channel that has the same name as everything else I just shared with you and started making content on there as a fan of the genre. And then a massive convention was created, which is called KCON. It's like the Comic-Con of this whole K-pop thing. And again, we're going to get into what that means. But I had an aspiration for the 2015 year, after two years of being on YouTube, to actually become a special guest there. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew I wanted to be there. I attended as a fan in 2013. And then in 2014, I did make my debut as a public speaker in this genre of entertainment. I also had the liberty of being able to go to quite a bit of places around the United States to either MC events, moderate panels, or facilitate different events and things of that sort. With that, I didn't quite have the podcast that I have just yet, but I was still known as a, a very heavyweight commentator on the genre. Uh, later on, because of all of the things that I was able to experience between 2013 and 2014 and 2015, myself, uh, one of my sisters and two of my best girlfriends, we established a business. It is called Mac G Productions. And with that, we have been able to do online and live events that predominantly focus on the genre, but that's not all that we do. We also do small business consultancy and guiding small and mid-sized businesses into finding their voice, securing their brand and things of that sort. So it's been a very fun ride. And that, if you will, gives me the authoritative, and I use that loosely, the authoritative stance to be able to be here at this moment and do this presentation with you all in this breakout. So moving on from that, the real important thing is what is K-pop? A lot of people hear it, and if they're unfamiliar with it, they hear the word cake pop, like the food. Or if they are mildly familiar they'll go oh bts but it's much more than that it's it's more than a trend it's more than the genre and it's most certainly not a flash in the pan and for those of you who might be fans of k-pop this picture here was taken at the k-pop museum in jeju-do or jeju island south korea in 2019 that is g dragon who is the leader of a group called big bang not the tv show <laughs> so K-pop, at the most basic way of explaining it, it's a facet of the Hallyu wave. The Hallyu wave is this word that was created somewhat with the influences of a large entertainment company in South Korea called SM Entertainment, as well as the influence and impact of Asia as a whole, predominantly China. So there's a little bit of some misomner that's come together to create this word, but it ultimately encompasses the music, television, and film, beauty, fashion, food, and tourism. Now, again, you might not have any awareness of the music, but maybe you've seen or heard about Train to Busan, or you heard about the big deal films that made history recently. So you might have a passing understanding of it, or maybe that's not your thing and you couldn't care less because right now your obsession is your skincare. You love these masks and these BB creams and things of that sort. Well, South Korea is where a lot of that got its legs underneath it to travel across the globe. 
or perhaps you are a person who loves golf or fitness uh, fashion, sports leisure attire. It's a very big deal over there and a lot of it is exported or influenced by that. The food, we have seen quite a bit of videos online about the magic of kimchi. You possibly have heard in recent news that there are some studies that says consuming kimchi during this pandemic has some beneficial effects. Do not quote me on that. Always do your own research. But nonetheless, it's always around. And finally, the tourism aspect of it. There has been a serious peak in how many people are trying to do their vacations or their semester abroad if they are privileged enough to do so, or at least attend a concert or a festival in South Korea. This is a soft power that has a huge global impact. And albeit you might have just heard about it recently within the past two to three years, or maybe even a little longer if you remember Psy Cognum style, the little horse dance, it's been around and it's not going anywhere. It is a real genuine global phenomenon. K-pop generates $89 million, United States dollars, if you will, in over 100 countries. And this was reported in 2019. And the magic of that is the fact that if it makes that much, even with things being disrupted as they are at this time, there's a genuine effort to continue to see it make more. And there are fans all over the world. You don't want to have the assumption that anything involving music or boy bands or girl groups only surfaces around the youth. People love music at all ages in all different facets of their life, and there's a lot to enjoy. There's a lot to critique as well, which makes it a little easier to come over into this whole side of podcasts. K-pop and podcasts, they definitely go hand in hand. If anything, it would be the more mature approach to the way that you can navigate being a fan of this, a commentating fan. So Hollywood commentary, this is not new. It's gone from traditional radio and Korean publications to trickling over the ocean into other countries and being on blogs such as Tumblr or individually hosted ones, forums like Reddit and Omana They Didn't, as well as social media. A lot of us have seen the pseudo political power, if you will, of K-pop fans with the TikTok movement of things that occurred in recent months. And of course, YouTube, a very big hitter at one point in time with the expansion of this by way of fans. Now, to clarify what I mean by that, yeah, music videos are available on YouTube. Duh. A lot of us catch them on there. And those of us who are unaware that videos are there, well, now you know. But even with the music videos being there, there were other people who were responsible for spreading the information about what was available for you to enjoy and what was available for you to check out. So you have names within our niche that are predominant, such as the Fine Brothers, which controversial or not, they did have a contributing impact on spreading awareness of the genre of music because they brought in a lot of big deal names to watch Cognum Style and other, you, uh, other videos that were available on YouTube. You also have uh, veterans in this, such as Michael Smith Grant, who he does things at this point in time that expand far beyond just K-pop, but he is a huge fan of it. JRE of JRE KML, they are a cousin duo, but at this time, the more predominant side of it is JRE on his own, who has gone from reacting to music videos and commentating on that to making humorous skits, as well as interviewing artists and idols of the South Korean type. <laughs> and it's been really interesting to watch it because he's also a podcaster as well at this time. You also have other veterans such as Two Men Jin Jung Ki, um, retirees is freshly flipped, who was a Texan native as well, and many others, including myself. I started as a content creator on YouTube doing MV reactions as a brand ambassador for a company called Reactor TV. Although the app is defunct, as I grew in my age, the type of content that I wanted to make changed. I started to dabble in something called Great Moments in Production and Delivery, which eventually birthed my podcast. But it would allow me an opportunity to look at a particular, particular artist 
look at their discography, explain some of the key points that you may or may not have noticed, and give it to you with musicology and histrionics involved, but make it digestible in a way where you're like, oh man, I never noticed that in this song, and now I'll never not hear it again. So it's been a fun thing to see how Hollywood vloggers have increased. In fact, MACG Productions at one point in time, we had an award system called the ASA Awards that is motivated by the fans and for the fans for them to acknowledge those who have commentated in various ways within the industry from talking about music videos and production to doing song covers and video choreography covers. So moving all of this into a podcast, when YouTube is making it a little bit more difficult for people to be able to do the things they previously did on there, it makes a lot of sense. Fans and spectators and those within the Korean industry are all over this. There are idols and artists who have podcasts of their own as well. So I keep saying podcast, podcast, podcast. What kind of podcasts are there? What are the types of podcasts? If you Google this, you will see some things that have a list as small as three, some as expansive as 16. I'm just giving you this. You have a solo or a monologue, one host, one person conveying their story or their own opinions and things of that sort. There's panel style, where you have a group of people who are discussing a particular topic, which sometimes can include a guest. There's interview, which are extremely common and very, very popular, where a person or persons are conducting an interview with a particular person of interest. Non-fictional storytelling, that's fairly self-explanatory conversational and that says conversational so i'm gonna keep that there because further on we're gonna move and you're gonna see something else questionable but conversational and co-hosted where you have at least two people who are taking on the responsibility of carrying this show and then repurposed content maybe you are a person who likes to talk about something that everyone is fully aware of and you're working it in a new angle to be able to explain different outlooks. Now we're talking about fandoms as a whole. Although I am putting K-pop as the predominant thing in this discussion, other examples of these in terms of fandom reach, um, a good one would be repurposed content. There is a podcast that is uh, exclusively on YouTube and it follows Jill's Marble Runs. Now I am a fan of marble runs and since this whole presentation is talking about what you can do as a fan of something these fans of this marble olympic and i mean it's legit it's it's legit <laughs> but these marble olympics there are fans who have created a show that talk about the content already they are talking about the commentary that occurred the strategies of the marbles and what we can anticipate in terms of assuming that there will be a winner for something else now one thing that you don't see on here and you might be thinking about you're like okay where is the review where's the ones who do commentary or or album reviews and things of that sort that can fall into almost any of these a solo such as myself reviews albums every single weekday but that could be something that could be broken down into a nonfiction storytelling if i want to expound upon it in different ways or it could also be uh something that's going to be a conversation with a co-host if i ever bring one on on occasion i do have special guests who are co-hosts or i could interview someone who was involved in that album aspect again this is not an exhaustive list this is just a few of the types that you could explore if you are a fan of a sport league or you're a fan of Star Wars or maybe you're not a Star Wars person, you're a Star Trek person. Any fandom has the opportunity to do these things. But something of more importance in that is the three mistakes to avoid and the things that you should do. So pivoting away from K-pop, Let's look at something else that um, we might be fans of. Maybe you are this huge fan 
of cooking competitions. You can't get enough of it. You know it's quirky. You couldn't care less. If you know there's a food competition taking place on YouTube or on TV, you are highly invested. You know who all of the cool people are and the, the cooking scene, the non-professional trained professionals. You watch Binging with Babish or maybe you like Not Another Cooking Show or You Suck at Cooking. This is your thing and you know it like the back of your hand no problem. However, with you knowing it like the back of the hand, maybe you've intimidated yourself. Oh my gosh, there's so many other podcasts. Like, how am I going to navigate this? Well, there's three major pitfalls and it says quick trip down memory lane because I want you to think back again. The first thing is reinventing the wheel. Anytime you've been considering hosting a show or starting a new one or pivoting the direction of the thing that you're currently doing, it is not necessary to reinvent the wheel. And you may have psyched yourself up believing that you have to. There is simply no need to do something new. You have to do it authentically and you have to be genuine about it so that you can maintain a commitment. There are countless YouTubers, countless podcasts, countless radio shows online and in the traditional sense where the same thing is available, but your audience will appeal to you as the host or the hosts and the way that you format your show. Don't reinvent the wheel. Just be very genuine about what it is that you're doing. Number two, not knowing your audience. So let's take that trip down memory lane. You know that you know all these things about these non-professionally trained professional chefs or cooking competitors and things of that sort. And you want to talk about food. That's what you want to do on your show. You're not quite confident if you're going to pull in a friend or a family member to do it with you, or if you're going to reach out to these people to try to interview them, but you know you're ready to talk about food, and you want the whole world to know, ah, 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 that's, no, don't, don't do that. There's no way that you can reach everyone. So if you're unaware of who your audience is, ultimately you're not going to succeed in the ways that you imagine. Your content the delivery, the language that you use, the tone, the editing, right down to the marketing of it, as well as the imagery, should all impact your ideal audience. In the case of my show, because I'm talking about albums, there's a whole generation that has no awareness of what an album is. They do know what a CD is, perhaps an MP3 player. They might be young enough or mid-age enough to remember when Apple had the Apple, uh, I can't even remember it now, not the iPad, but the iPod. There we are. There's a disconnect. However, my logo for my show is a turntable with a record on it. And at one point in time, I had it with a different structure, but that record has almost always been there, which leads me over to the number three thing. You're unwilling to try new things you have to try and try and try and try and try again. As I was saying previously, yes, the record has always been there. At one point in time, I had different branding colors and I would have the image of the um, album cover to the right-hand side and then I would have the name of it and things of that sort because I was trying to make this work better for visual aspects on YouTube. That didn't work in the long run. I am the end-all be-all of my show. I don't have the time to constantly edit that. But if I can get a really strong image and maintain that, the colors and everything are intentional and it maintains an experience for my audience that they know, oh, we're talking music. That works. I see a few people are talking about, I still have my iPod Classic. And those things held so much music Oh my gosh, <laughs> they held a lot of content. So these are the things that you want to avoid when you are creating your fandom podcast, or maybe you're already podcasting and you're like, oh man, how can I get more people to listen to me? And other, keep these things in mind before you jump off the deep end. Now, the things that you can do, the things that you can do, first and foremost, want to be yourself. Thank you for just being you. You can't go any wrong with that. Your presence is always appreciated when you are just the host. You are coming into people's homes, their car, their kitchen, their headphones, just by being yourself. The things that you do want to do 
And I made sure to not put this in the slide because I want to show you all. Remember that one little moment you saw back there? One moment. I'm going to show you the authenticity of working on things at the last minute and sorting out your ideas and trying to get it sorted out. This presentation would not have been able to be accomplished if it weren't for two people who are in attendance in here right now. That's Cy and TJ, and they stayed up very late with me last night to help me organize my thoughts. And one of the things that we talked about is what you should do. And the first thing I said was, oh, logically, you should plan for mistakes. And lo and behold, when you know it, the first thing that we did while we were typing is spelled mistakes incorrectly. <laughs> Sometimes mistakes are going to happen. You cannot avoid it. Maybe you uploaded an episode a little bit too early, or maybe you thought you had the audio synced and you went back and you listened to it and it's completely empty and quiet. There's nothing wrong with authentically admitting to your audience, hey guys, I had an episode scheduled for today, but let me tell you, life got in the way. So we'll pick it back up, X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. We appreciate that. You being you is irreplaceable. Almost anyone can do the content that you're proposing to do. No one can do it like you. Another thing that you should do is have an outline. Case in point, you all are looking at the draft of my complete and utter transparency is how I try to handle my brand 24 seven. So I have no qualms or shame about sharing this with you. So having an outline, when you have an outline, you don't want to be aggressively concrete about that. That does not allow you to be flexible for things such as the kiss aches that we just talked about. Those things can occur. Life is a thing that will disrupt the best laid plans. And the longer you live it, the more that you realize it. You have a choice to embrace that. Flexibility is the key. Know your fan base. These are the ones that are mutually invested in the same or similar content as you. You can't just say that you want to talk about Korean music and you want to talk about it with all the Korean music fans. That's not realistic. In my case, my show, I want to speak to people between the ages of 21 and 35 predominantly. Yes, I have other listeners, but to them. They've had enough musical experience at this point in their life and a little bit of diversity where they're going to be able to reference if I'm saying something sounds like it was inspired by Richard Raymond in the United States or the boy band Blue or um, Kylie Minogue they'll have a little bit more life experience to be able to make those associative moments happen. And finally, have a network around you. These are the people who you can learn from and be inspired by. The multitude of people who have attended the PodFest Global Summit, other podcasts that you admire, other YouTubers that you find to be very entertaining. These are human people. <laughs> and sometimes we put within our mind that they're untouchable because of the content they make and the impact that it has on us. That's not realistic. Nothing hurts to just send an email or send a direct message on social media if they have that open to just say, hey, I like what you're doing. I want to learn a little bit more. I have a question about this. Do you have a moment to answer? The least they can do is say no. The max is you could end up getting a new mentor out of it. So you have to be open to those type of things and not willing to discourage yourself from finding opportunities. You never know where they might be specifically available to you. And finally, the best thing that I can do for you all is send you on your way to be new podcast or improved podcast creators for your favorite fandom and to thank you for your attendance. You can keep up with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube with the word multifaceted ACG, all one word. And you can also check out my podcast at a 3 Podcast. Dot com. And I would like to leave this moment open so that we can discuss any questions or ideas that anyone may have. I appreciate your attendance nonetheless. Thank you. So do we have any? <laughs> this was awesome. Thank you. So it's so many things in the chat. I see Marble League was mentioned, the most highly anticipated sporting event of the year. Now I remember winning a 20 gigabyte iPod back in the day. Oh, my gosh. That's intense. I just threw out my eye touch. It wouldn't turn on anymore. Oh, it died. Kissakes, kissing your mistakes and embracing them. 
I'm with it, Nikita. That's a good one. <laughs> Gotta kiss the mistakes because they're your path towards greatness. I love that. And one of the episodes that me and my co-host did, we had some wrong information that also made us sound insensitive. I think we apologized several times before we moved on. And it happens. There are things that occur in real time. You're just like, ah, <laughs> but you got to be willing to take the Miss Frizzell approach to things. You have to take chances, make mistakes and get messy. And, you know, there's going to be someone who's not going to be pleased with it no matter what. It never fails. Uh, but those aren't the people that we're, we're creating content for. First and foremost, we're doing it for ourselves. And then secondly, we're doing it for the enjoyment of our target audience. So, yeah. That's what I got. And that's what makes Meetup so wonderful. They're quick and straight to the point. I only took 30 minutes of y'all life. I started at 602 and ended at 632. <laughs> I appreciate all of you popping in on this. I truly do. This will be uh, part down and uploaded very shortly to my YouTube channel as I have a following of over 10,000 Mekwalas. That's my name for the most amazing fandom a little content creator could ever have. So I don't like to uh, prevent them from being able to access things that I do. They are that important to me. So I appreciate you all. I hope you have a wonderful Friday wherever you are in the world. Be safe, be whole, find peace of mind this weekend, and hopefully in something in the future, I will catch you all again. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>